Well, hello. I wanted to walk you through my latest favorite mechanic for making wedding bouquets. And I have done a wedding bouquet tutorial in the past showing one of my favorite mechanics. And then as of the last couple of months, I've just been experimenting and playing around with a mechanic that most of us are probably familiar with, but I have been revisiting it and have just found it super helpful. So whether you're a brand new designer and you're looking for a wedding bouquet tutorial, <laughs> welcome. Or if you're simply interested in understanding Kathleen's latest favorite mechanic in terms of creating wedding bouquets, this is it. And I originally learned this mechanic when I was doing a workshop with Holly Chapel. At the time, I didn't really love it. It wasn't really jiving with the kind of work I wanted to create, so I just set it aside. I set it aside for multiple years. And then a few months ago, I kind of picked it up and made a few adaptations to it just to make it work for me. And now I've kind of, this is just what I'm feeling right now. So one of the things you will always hear me tell you is that there is no one right way to make a wedding bouquet. There are so many different mechanics that you can learn and it's so valuable, it's so important that as a floral designer, we continue to experiment, try new mechanics, and don't ever feel like that learning curve ends. And it's one of my favorite parts about being a creative is that the learning never stops. So I'm gonna go through the whole design process with you, talk you through the mechanic in terms of the details and just a few things that have really worked for me, show you the actual design process. And as per my usual approach, I will also, at the end of this video, give you the full STEM count, any kind of lessons learned in terms of things I might do differently next time, because there's always things that we would do differently next time. But we'll also talk pricing and just, you know, all the real practical commercial floristry things. Let's just do this thing. Before we actually jump into the design mechanics side of things, one of the best lessons that I learned as a floral designer that I continue to really lean into is spend more time planning your ingredients and thinking about your ingredients than you actually do designing. And this is a clue that I picked up from the food industry where professional chefs and the Michelin star rated chefs spend a huge amount of time thinking about and planning the specific ingredients they're going to use. And they do that so that then the actual production process is so much easier. Because if you start with great ingredients, even on your worst day, things look awesome <laughs> when you put them together. So I had this idea that might just completely fall on its face, but we're all going to stay open-minded. I had this idea that I wanted to create an all carnation wedding bouquet. And this is something that I've had in the back of my head for a really long time. And so my first step in the design process in this instance was to actually jump on Pinterest and have a little look around, look for a little bit of inspiration. And in my head, I had thought this bouquet was just going to be monochromatic and it was just going to all be about the textures and kind of, you know, the fluffiness of the carnations. But then I found this picture, which got me thinking, oh, I love this kind of ombre effect because I am all about experimentation, new ideas, and let's see what comes out the other side and we shall all learn from this experience. I thought, yeah, this is just going to actually make this experiment even better. So creating an ombre effect, all carnation bridal bouquet. That is the mission my friends. So I just popped up to the wholesaler, grabbed colors in an ombre palette that I could find. It's super fascinating in terms of like pale lime green and lemon and pure white and just all the different tints and tones. And this is one of the reasons that I love carnations is that they come in all the different Crayola colors. So if you're a OG Crayola person, if you had the pack with like hundreds of Crayolas in it, my friends, we are kindred spirits. <laughs> That's where this idea came from. So this idea of just jumping on Pinterest and actually looking for inspiration. And this is how I have learned so much about Kathleen being able to create the kind of works that she wants to create. Just like if you were an art student, you would be spending a huge amount of time looking at artists' work that you admire, putting in the time and energy to figure out how they create that kind of work. And this is probably one of my favorite creative exercises because A, you get to sit on the sofa. B, it doesn't cost you a penny. <laughs> and there is so much to continually learn and experience and play with and consider and just so much creativity and so much possibility in terms of really immersing yourself in your favorite florist's work. This 
inspiration is from this Pinterest photo, but it's also with one of my favorite color palettes. So that is where the original idea came from. Now, let us talk about mechanics. So when it comes to the mechanic for this design, I am just using boring old chicken wire. Nothing fancy, nothing expensive, just the stuff you buy at Home Depot, Bunnings, wherever it is you get your chicken wire. The thing that's been really helpful for me is actually making it smaller than I thought it needed to be. So this piece actually only is four or five squares wide and then two or three squares high. Where I got myself into trouble before was having too big a piece of chicken wire, which then requires a lot of product to cover it up. So this small size has been super helpful. One other mechanic that is super helpful when you're working with carnations is learning how to wire them. Or in this instance, I'm actually using a skewer. So those wooden skewers that you might barbecue chicken on are the same thing that you can use to replace a stem on the carnations. I don't actually do this with all the carnations. I only do it with the ones that are broken. So if you get your pack of carnations and there are any broken stems in them, don't panic. This is super simple, super helpful, and something that you can do well ahead of time because carnations can last out of water for quite a while. So all I do is trim off the excess stem. I then take the pointy end of the skewer and I put it directly up where the stem was. I then take a small piece of wire and I actually slide it right through the stem head on the carnation and I bend it down so it's kind of equidistant on both sides. Then I just take my stem tape and if you're doing this for a paying client, highly recommend recommend that you actually take the time and put your stem tape all the way down the skewer so that it all appears to be green. I hold the chicken wire right above where I actually hold the stems of the flowers. So if you're used to designing and holding stems in one hand, I actually just rest the chicken wire directly above it. I don't really hold on to the chicken wire itself. Those first couple placements are always a bit tricky because everything wants to slide around in your hand, but I promise after six or seven stems are in there, the process becomes easier. So it's totally fine to just dare I say, throw in the first couple of stems knowing you can always move their placements around later. In this instance, I am just sticking to one color carnation in those first placements. This is something that you need to be really mindful of if you're designing in this kind of ombre effect is the way that it's created is that you're very deliberate and you're very intentional with your color placements. The minute we kind of start to color across the lines is the minute that we start to lose some of that ombre effect. So it's totally fine. And the reason I love this chicken wire mechanic is because it's super easy to move your flowers around. You have a lot more possibilities and opportunities, but it doesn't become completely unwielding and you take so much pressure off the weight of your hand, which is super important. Something else that you can actually do ahead of time to help make the design process easier is remove all of the foliage on your carnations and also take the time to really fluff out the heads of the carnations. In transportation and just in the kind of growing production process, carnations tend to be transported with their heads really tightly squished together. So taking the time to really fluff out each one and taking the time to make sure that each individual flower looks as good as possible will make your end design just that much better. One thing I also do through the production process that I think is different to how other florists operate is that when I am designing wedding work, when I am creating bouquets, I actually will go through and trim the stems as I go. One thing that you'll find when you're carrying this many flowers in your hand is that it gets really heavy really quickly. Much of that weight is just simply because of the stem of the flower. So I find removing the stem just helps take so much of the weight off your hand and off your wrist, which means that you can stay doing design just a little bit longer. 
One of the most common questions that I get is, Kathleen, how do you create so much depth and visual interest in your bouquets? And the trick is, remember that you have three dimensions that you get to work with. So there is the up, down, scenario, there's the left right scenario, but then there's kind of the back to front scenario. For the longest time, one of the reasons I struggled with design is because I only really focused on two dimensions, but always reminding yourself to play with that third dimension is what will help create a way more visually interesting bouquet. So you'll actually see here that the carnations are at different heights and they're also at different angles. This is what keeps the human eye interested in the design. This is what makes floristry so high impact and learning to get good at playing with all three dimensions just takes practice. So as we put in the last few stems, and don't panic, I will show you the end result in a second. As I work through the last few placements of each carnation, I wanted to just take a minute and talk about stem count and talk about pricing. So I will actually just link to a blog post on my website that talks you through the right pricing formula to use. And when it comes to stem count, I like to follow the general rule that when it comes to a bridal bouquet, you're going to want to use between 35 and 45 stems. Because with carnations, you're also going to have a pretty high breakage rate, I highly recommend that you actually buy extra. And in this instance, I had four different colors that I used. So I just divided it equally across those 40-ish stems. Obviously, if you're going for a slightly different color palette, then you can adjust accordingly. So you can see here as we finish up the bouquet, I'm actually just securing the stems with an elastic band. I do like to turn the whole bouquet upside down just so that I can get that elastic band at the binding point. This then makes the ribbon finishing that much easier easier. You can also th see through the whole process of flipping the thing upside down, you don't really see the chicken wire. It's amazing that we can use such a simple mechanic to create such a light, fluffy bouquet, and the whole mechanic gets covered through the process. And when it comes to finishing off the handle and attaching the ribbon, this is my process. I take the one centimeter wide pot tape and I wrap it around so that it covers the handle. Essentially, you want your client to be able to wrap three fingers around the tape and the ribbon. Obviously, the tape in the end isn't going to be seen, but that kind of three finger rule is something I was taught at flower school and I find it's quite comfortable. So I tend to do a couple of strips of the pot tape and then the trick that I learned that saved my world when it came to ribboning a handle, is you take a separate piece of pot tape and you start to actually wrap it around the same way that you wrapped around the other pieces. But after about two centimeters, you wrap it back on itself so that it almost acts like a piece of double-sided tape. Then you can attach your ribbon and you're not struggling to kind of keep it in place as you finish the finishing touches on your bouquet. So I just finish it off with a line of pearl pins. And then if I am using our long trailing ribbons, which is almost always the case, I simply attach those to the front of the bouquet. And voila, there you go.